we're going to go through these three advanced concepts uh, that all consultants know. Um, and it's going to be especially useful for you starting your rotations uh, as you get into as you get into your rotations uh, in your clinical rotations. Because what you'll be doing, you'll be assessing patients, taking histories, making these assessments, and then presenting them to, you, to your bosses. And I, I found that these couple of things that I'm going to teach you now just really, really helped in trying to make it sound really sharp and, and very useful. Oh my God, Amy, you've got your puppy there with you. Yes, this is Joey. He's very needy. He loves to cuddle in the mornings <laughs> after breakfast. <laughs> Who knows what he's going to learn today? Excellent. Okay, so they never tell you until now because I'm going to reveal these secrets. Uh, now, the ground rules, as we know, safe place. I'm going to ask you questions. Um, yeah, feel free to get everything wrong. Don't care. That means that you'll get it right the next time. Uh, that's me. Now, the aim is I want you to start thinking with the frameworks that I've got in my, in my head. Um, and these frameworks are just so useful and they are able to allow me to communicate really effectively with my colleagues. If you speak the same language that I speak as a consultant, it'll just help everything, whether it's, you know, communicating your patient's needs to them or just getting a good reference because they think that you understand what's going on. Uh, so we'll go through a couple of real life practical examples and hopefully make you a gun intern as is always the, always the aim. Now, so what we're going to go through the real way to perform an assessment, the critical issue, and hopefully we'll have time to for this topic of when to postpone or proceed with surgery. Um, if we don't have time for that, it's I've got it up as a video um, on my channel anyway. Now, so the first question I've got for you guys, uh, please anyone jump in. What's your framework to assess any stable patient? What's your framework? Go for it. Um, honestly, not too sure what would happen in like real practice. Yeah. whether we would check the emr first or whether because right now we're just interviewing patients yeah, that's, but that's i think true. that i think that we would probably check the emr first to get a little bit of a background Beautiful. on the patient you gave me a really good practical answer which is check the emr and and you know realistically you, you, you do all that reviewing of notes often before seeing the patient and that's actually a really good thing good thing to say one of the consultants um, who examines us for the part two exam. Every time we, you know, he said, how would you assess this thoracic patient for a, you know, lobectomy? And someone says, well, I'll do a, his, do a full assessment with a history examination investigations. He just shouts back and says, no, you wouldn't. You would review all the patient notes and medical record and then go and attend the, to the patient. So that was actually a really good answer. Um, so regardless of whether you do the EMR or interview the patient, this is your framework, right? Um, so from this point of view, this is what I'd say, but from your point of view, that, that is definitely what you do. So feel free to say either of those things. That sounds really good, Amy. So I'd review all patient notes and then I attend the patient and do a thorough assessment with history examination investigation. Now, this sounds like a really obvious point, but every time you get asked to how to assess a patient, this is literally the answer that consultants want to hear. And it's so easy, but just trust me that when you're on the wards and people, people ask you this question, that's what's going to happen. So, uh, Cindy, how do you assess a 50 year old patient post-op knee replacement? How do you assess their pain? Have a chat with the patient. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to say, you're going to say those magic words. History exam investigation. Fantastic. Exactly. Right. Just, just remember it's obvious it's boring, but it's, it's what they want to hear to show that you've got the same framework. Um, okay. And uh, Ricky, uh, how do you assess this 50-year-old male's chest pain in emergency? Um, history, examination, investigation. Uh, I hope you don't think this is ridiculous because this is exactly what you're going to... You, they, they're going to be amazed that you say that. <laughs> um, uh, other Cindy, how do you assess this five-year-old's level of... child's level of dehydration? Um, history, examination, investigation. Uh, fantastic. You guys are geniuses. Uh, history, examination, investigation. Uh, has any consultant so far said this in this way to you? Or is this the first time? Okay, good. Okay. So maybe this is not, that's all right. This is not the, this is not the purpose of the tute anyway. So this is how you assess every patient. And this is pretty much the only tools we have to gather information. So um, can someone tell me what is the point of this? What is the point of this, you know, this assessment type thing? Um, it's to get a complete picture. So we get um, the patient's point of view. We get a background on what, on you know, the, with the history. Yes. And we get a few um, like signs and symptoms, and some of those are subjective and some are objective. Yes. Um, then we move on to um, the history, where we get our 
um, like clinical signs and we do our clinical correlations for our differential diagnoses. Yes. And then we investigate to make sure. So the things that we can't check physically ourselves. Yes. Um, and we check those markers. Beautiful. And at the end of that, what would you like to get? A diagnosis. Fantastic. That's that, and, and that, that, that actually shows you've got a really good framework. So I'm really happy that you said that, that level of detail because that's, that's literally what I do every single time. So this is the most, you know, there's, there's a captain obvious of statements. I do an assessment to get my differential diagnoses or diagnosis. Now, after that, again, this is the full framework to just give you a bit of context. With the diagnosis, we can then commence treatments. You know, we know what's going on. In this well-stable patient, we commence treatment once we have a diagnosis. So there's conservative which is pharmacological, non-pharmacological, and invasive, which is interventional and surgical. The next thing I want to tell you is consultants or supervisors, they really love you giving these broad pictures, especially when you're junior. Um, so when they say, how can we treat this patient? Just like we had that repeated thing of history, examination, investigation for assessment. When, we, when you're asked, how do you, you know, how do you treat this patient? You'll start by saying, well, there's conservative and invasive. Conservative is pharmacological, non-pharmacological, invasive can be interventional, surgical, depending on what the problem is. So again, this is the framework that uh, I'm not necessarily sure if med school teaches you, but every consultant that I know would approach it this way. So I, I really want to give you that transition between whatever med school teaches you and what happens in that clinical world. So that's the full framework. Um, is there a situation, someone, when you don't get a um, diagnosis, but you'll still give treatment? Yeah, you can give empirical treatment for yes. suspected infections. Oh, what was that? Sorry? Uh, like suspected infections, potentially. Is an example yeah, absolutely. That. That's a good one. So if someone's pretty unstable with a suspected infection, you can give just empirical antibiotics uh, because it's better to treat, to treat you know, meningitis type symptoms with a full barrage of stuff before you get a diagnosis because it's so serious. And then generally speaking, any unstable or sick patient, you just treat You just treat symptomatically, right? You give oxygen if the oxygen sat's low, you ventilate if they're not ventilating, you give blood you give blood pressure agents and volume if their blood pressure is low, because you know that they'll die from that. So you've got to treat the signs anyway. So that's that framework there. Now, now uh, are you guys, do you guys have your um, frameworks from Tally O'Connor, your assessment stuff? Uh, or your clinical, you know, can I, the clinical questions that you ask? Um, yeah, so the university provided us with stuff last year. I believe that they just like kind of tweaked tally, like and maybe just yep. like brought it down a few levels from the level of tally okay. um, for us. And then we've been recommended this year to um, investigate tally to supplement it because our consultants will be asking us, you know, some higher level questions than what we had last year. Excellent. That's great. So what do you, uh, so let's say in this example, a six-year-old male sees you in GP clinic with occasional chest pain. What do you ask on assessment? Amy, do you want to have a go at this? I know it might be a while since you guys have reviewed that. So I don't expect you to get it perfectly. What kind of stuff do you want to ask this patient on your history? Um, so I want to know uh, the site of chest pain, yep. severity, uh, maybe popping it on a scale and how it feels to him or her. Mm -hmm. um, oh, um, I would also ask whether he's had anything like this before. Um, if, ha and then I'd probably move, if he has, I'd like characterize how many times he's had it um, and how frequently it's kind of occurred and what's brought it on. Then I'd move back onto this event and I'd probably say, okay, what were you doing um, at the time of this event? What was your onset? Um, have you had any changes to the severity over time? Um, and then I would ask about some um, like relevant associated features. So like diaphoresis, shortness of breath, um, whether he's had, um, had any loss of consciousness. Just to, whether just to he recap had what you just did there, you did the chest pain history. Uh, so all the mm -hmm. pain questions. And then you now you're doing the systems review for cardiovascular just to try and uh, try to find out any other little bits that will give you clues to other illnesses. So yeah, keep going. That's really good. Yeah. Um, so whether his pain is radiated, um, whether he's had a coronary event in the past, whether he has a family history of coronary events, um, if he has any um, cardiovascular risk factors, such as um, hypertension, 
lipidemia, um, his age and his um, and his sex are both risk factors. Um, assess his body habitus by the end of the bed. Um, and yeah, try to rule in like, you know, my red flags, like, or like rule in or out my red flags um, and then move on to other things. So, you know, whether it might just be some um, reflux or um, a, a GERD or something like that. Oh, yeah, as in, could it be differential diagnosis for chest pain and what are those things? That's really good. So you yeah. covered a lot of things really quickly, which is fantastic. So it shows you've learned. So you went through, for me, a history of presenting complaint, uh, and then you did a systems review, and then you did a few of these part, uh, you know, comprehensive kind of history things. So that was that was really good, Amy. So now just to give you the significance of this first thing that you did, the chest pain history, and the pain questions are, you know, literally, I've, I've, I haven't I haven't put it up here, but have you had it before? Site radiation severity character. That's like, you know, the I, the way I think of that is, you know, where is it and how bad is it? And then the timing, onset, offset, timing, synchronicity, whatever that is, and then aggravating, relieving, and associated factors. So this, to get the significance of how important it is to know every one of these questions, I was in a basic surgical training exam, the first exam, the, the Viber, and I was just um, as, assisting on that. And probably, you know, over 80% of the surgical trainees, these are, you know, second, third, fourth year doctors couldn't get these questions. And because they forgot the timing question, they didn't get the diagnosis that this was a tumor slow growing instead of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. That's how critical these questions are. And, you know, in, in the pressure of the moment, you probably forget these things, but you know, if you, if you can hit this every single time as the, you know, pain questions, then you're ahead of, 80% of the surgical trainees I saw on that day. Okay. So that's how important this stuff is. Um, systems review. Yeah. Uh, all these questions are important. I'll get that to you. And then in your, in your third year or fourth year, I forget when it is the, the elective, they ask us to do case-based discussions. So many people don't just ask these past history, family history, socially, they fail because they just don't remember to ask this. So I'd almost say there's a low bar to passing these case-based discussions, but people just forget this basic stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I just really implore you to learn this. And I'm, I'm not going to go on too much about this, but this is your total framework. History presenting complaint, any pain questions, or you've got an issue, you can modify the pain questions to, you know, to identify what that issue is. Systems review and, and all of the past history, family history, et cetera, questions. Okay, so when you go through the you know abbreviated tally Connor, what what is chest pain uh, a sign of, Cindy? Go um, okay, Cindy. Uh, well, it could be a sign of myocardial ischemia. It could be a sign of, um, it could be from the lungs. It could be from the pancreas potentially. Absolutely. So just anything in that area potentially. Yeah, beautiful. If you if you can imagine anatomy, you can go. Yep, something there's going to hurt. Therefore, that could be chest pain. So, yeah, to me, that's is in the cardiovascular sense, it's ischemic heart disease or aortic dissection. Uh, Ricky, how about shortness of breath, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and edema? What are these signs of or symptoms of? Um, all those together usually associate with um, heart failure. Fantastic. Palpitations, what's that, what's that a sign of? Uh, Amy? Um, can be a sign of AF. Um, or it could also be some like hyperparathyroid, uh, hyperthyroidism, um, increased sympathetic nervous activity is what I'm thinking of. Yeah, sounds good. So if it was hyperthyroidism or sympathetic nervous activity, that's causing some kind of tachycardia or some kind of altered beats. And so that's just a you know vague sign of palpitation. Interestingly, all you have to do is an ECG, which is pretty easy and readily available, and boom, you have your diagnosis usually. Um, but sometimes it could be the history of something that's happened in the past that you can't pinpoint right now. Um, next, I think next, Cindy, uh, syncope, what's that a sign of? Um, I'm thinking of like heart blocks. Yeah, absolutely. If you have heart block, you can get that. And then there's other things that you can get it with valve problems. So severe aortic stenosis, for example, or mitral stenosis, you can get syncope as well, but it's really syncope can be a cause of many, many things. How about claudication? Um, claudication is kind of like an indication of peripheral vascular disease. Perfect. So as you can see, each of these systems review questions, it's just like you're trying to find stuff that could also be associated in a person with various risk factors. So, you know, that's the point of each, the cardiovascular systems review or the respiratory systems review. And it's probably obvious to you guys, but I thought I'd just quickly go over it. Now, my, my, the point of this now is something they didn't teach us and really em emphasize until even 
you know, anesthetic training. So how do you get to the next level of expertise and understanding? So the history get the, or the assessment gets your diagnosis. And now I want to do more with that diagnosis. So think about that. That's pretty much the whole point of my assessment is a diagnosis because I can get treatment, but then the, I guess the urgency to which I get, give that treatment is based on this, con this next concept. So you ask a thorough history, perform your great examination and review all investigations, and then you find this stuff. Um, so uh, just looking at this history, so let's say you've done this history and this is what you found, this is the examination and these are the investigations that you found out. Sorry for that typo there. Can someone tell me what do you, what do you make of this? What, do you, what is your diagnosis or how do you present this information to your colleague? So I could say 60 year old male presents to emergency department um, with central chest pain on exertion um, and shortness of breath on exertion. Um, briefly, investigations, um, briefly the investigations indicate a potential um, left heart hypertrophy. Um, so this is seen, oh, like I, I don't know whether I'd say that, but anyway, um, so this is, um, supported by um, ankle swelling, by basal fine crackles, and an elevated GBP on examination, um, a normal ECG, um, but on uh, investigation, but chest X-ray revealed cardiomegaly, and the echocardiography revealed um, his ejection fraction, his left ventricle ejection fraction is forty percent. Hey, that's really good, Amy. Now I'm going to, I like that you gave this kind of summary at the start. I'm, I'm going to sharpen that summary now for you. Um, you so you, you gave me the introduction. So the patient, 60 year old male, so age, gender presents with this problem. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to get you guys next thing to do is go straight to the diagnosis. So what do you reckon that, that there's two obvious pathologies that come to me from this presentation? What do you reckon those are? If you were to give me two diagnoses. I'm thinking HEFREF. I don't know what that like is. Like heart failure, like heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Oh, wow. I've never heard of HEFREF. <laughs> That's good. So let's say it's heart failure. Keep going. Is there another diagnosis here? Chest pain on exertion? Um, we probably want to rule out an MI, I suppose. Um, exactly. But I don't necessarily think it's an MI here. And MI is the worst part of this kind of syndrome of things. And you can broadly say, if you weren't sure, you know, I've given you a, I've just given you a vague history here, chest pain and exertion that's with these other features sounds like it's a part of the acute coronary syndrome pathology. So it could be stable angina, unstable angina, non-STEMI, STEMI, or, you know, non-STX, STX. So what diagnosis the patient have? So some kind of acute coronary syndrome and some level of heart failure. So if you think of your presentation, then you give me that summary of age, gender presentation on assessment, this patient likely has acute coronary syndrome and elements of heart failure. And I'll really love that you then use that language. It, this is supported by, so we'll go into that in a second. So what this means is that back in the day when I was a medical student or medical students present to me, or even interns and residents present to me, they do an assessment and they literally just present back the history. But that's kind of pointless. It's like you've gathered all the information, but you haven't synthesized it for me. So you're not really adding value to what you've already found out. So the whole point of this presentation to make you sound sharp is you give you a little summary statement, you tell me what you, di you think your diagnosis is, and then you s say, this is supported by this, this, and this. So, you know, acute coronary syndrome, this is supported by chest pain exertion and these risk factors. Um, the fact that this patient has um, heart failure is supported by signs of ankle swelling, by basal fine crackles, elevated JVP, and the you know echo showing it, an ejection fraction of 40%. So here's the, here's the gold stuff that I wish someone had taught me at the start. Have, have you guys heard of severity and stability of disease as a, as a concept, not just the words? No. Excellent, good, good. So now diagnosis is hard enough, but once you get the diagnosis, this is everything. Like this is, um, it's so significant that you make an assessment of severity and stability because that will then determine what your course of action is and how quickly you handle something. Um, in, in fact, it's so important that you'll find that there's just scores for severity everywhere. Ha, um, ha, has anyone heard of a heart failure scoring system? Okay, good. Um, the NYHA heart failure score, you'll you look that up now because it will come up time and time again, whether you're on gen med, cardiology or whatever, as soon as someone's got heart failure, your consultant wants to know what the score is. 
um, because that will be a big thing. So NYHA, New York Heart Association um, uh, score for heart failure. There's an angina score and that's a Canadian class score as well. And they're very similar. Um, if you have atrial fibrillation, there's a Chad Vass score that scores the you know risk of thrombosis. So every single, um, all, so many different pathologies diseases will have a score for severity. And it's very important that you know that because that's how we talk about these things. And if they don't have a score for severity, you can just estimate what you think the severity is. So let's go through that a little bit. So, you know, med student level, junior doctor level, you get the information. The next thing is you're able to get a diagnosis, but then the ultimate level is you want to make a gamble on severity. And it's actually really easy. It makes you sound really good. Um, and it, you know, it just doesn't take too much more to do it. Just a little bit of extra knowledge, a little bit of extra synthesis. So what would you need to ask? Um, so how, how would you get an idea of severity of these questions? Like what would be the next thing you ask? Do you mean in terms of like a assessment in terms of history? Yeah, let, let's say on history, what, what extra things would you would give you an idea of the severity and on examination, how could you determine severity? And just, just you know, just, um, just riff here, like it doesn't, it, it, I'm, I'm not holding you to any of this. Okay, um, so in history, I guess the most important question you can ask is how much it affects their daily life. Yeah, or, that's good. Um, yeah, how much it's, uh, and if it's pain, you know, just the, the pain skill questions as well. Mm -hmm. Um, examination, you're really just looking for, well, I guess it's more subjective, just like say the amount of ankle swelling mm -hmm. or how obvious the physical examination findings are. Yeah, that's good. How obvious it is. And so, um, this is stuff that you'll see as you, as you watch your registrars doing examinations and take histories. So I like that you said activity, activities of daily living, because that's pretty much what I ask. I can ask, like, you can ask specific things like how far do you have to walk to get claudication or chest pain or shortness of breath. So when you document exactly how far, 100 meters, 50 meters, walking up the stairs, walking to, the, to your door, suddenly your consultants and whoever you're reporting to get a really good idea of what's going on. So that amount. Now, using that logic, how could you determine, say, the degree of ankle, ankle swelling? What could you just logically use? Yeah, that's right. I think someone just pointed up on the chat there. Um, that you could literally just go, how far do I have pitting edema of my ankles? Like how far up the leg does it go? And that sounds like a, it, it's, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? But the fact that you're a medical student actually doing that, that will just speak volumes, okay? Uh, how about the JVP? How could you assess the severity of your JVP? Um, you could just measure the amount of elevation. Exactly, amount of vertical elevation above the sternal angle, that's your, uh, you know, in centimeters, that's your elevated JVP. So that's it really. Like uh, this might sound so obvious, but I want you to know that it's, it speaks volumes of your experience. So severity, distance, shortness of breast exertion, what's the distance, ankle swelling, how much, what's the degree, bi-basal fine crackles, how high up the chest are you auscultating to get that, um, you know, to get that, um, how far the chest are the crackles uh, going. Elevated JVP, what's the centimeters of elevation above the sternal angle. And then the, the best stuff is, once you have measurements, for example, you know, if you have an actual measurement of your cardiomegaly, you know, how far across the AP, sorry, across the lateral diameter, does that chest, does that heart silhouette actually extend? And with the echocardiography, they'll give you, you know, an ejection fraction of 40%, or they'll say diastolic dysfunction, one, two, three, or whatever it is. And what you'll then know, you can look it up, you know, what is 40%, what's normal? So normal is above 50%, and you'll realize that 40% is probably about moderate LV dysfunction. So uh, does anyone have any questions about that? If you take a history and start asking these a, li a little bit of detail on top of your original history, you suddenly sound sharper. Oh, I had a question with you. Um, yeah, please. For bi basal fine crackles, how do you, I guess, classify that degree? Is it just how loud it is or? Yeah, uh, look, so I haven't been, I haven't done physician stuff for a long time. So I just apologize if this is wrong for the current stuff that they might talk about, but you could say, look, crackles are present they are up, you know, to maybe, you know, half the chest or in, in all the lower zones. And you might say they, they're quite loud. All of this might, plus the rest of the picture might give you an indication, but just remember you just saying something like, look, it sounds like on assessment, this patient has heart failure. It, it looks moderate based on decent fine crackles by basally throughout the whole chest, plus the echo, plus the shortness of breath on exertion to hundred meters. 
So as long as you make a gamble on what you think it is, that it, that's okay no matter what you say, um, because then you can have a discussion about that. Stability then is just about deciding how different is this to the normal state and then making a call about it. So we'll get into that in a second. So to enhance your presentation, estimate the severity and stability of the illness. So on assessment, this patient has new onset severe anginal symptoms, signs and symptoms of moderate NYHA2 heart failure. And this is supported by a constant chest pain, it's the first episode, shortness of breath on exertion, edema, elevated JP, and investigation findings of cardiomegaly. So again, just to reiterate, I, I'm not just reporting back history, examination, investigations, I'm synthesizing it into a diagnosis and then giving an indication of severity and stability. And that's the progression assessment equals diagnosis, then severity and stability, which is supported by these things. And that's the detail. So is, do you remember what the app is that has all of these like scales on it? Like, you know, oh, yeah. Med MedCalc? MedCalc. MedCalc. Okay, cool. Thank mm -hmm. you. There's actually quite a few apps that are kind of med calculated in the title and all of them will be fine. Um, and there's one that always comes up whenever I look up Chad Vask online, there's always one calculator that comes up. That's, that's really well presented. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, again, uh, definitely download all of those, because you could literally search, uh, actually, here's a good tip. Whatever disease you find on diagnosis, Google severity score disease, and then it'll take you to the next level of what you could say. So again, you start making a presentation of a history and you don't know what the severity score is because you're a medical student. You've just done two years, whatever. You just Google it and suddenly the information is at your disposal. And again, you'll sound good. You'll get good references. You get the job you want, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, try this exercise. You're asked to review a 60-year-old male with COPD and new onset fever. Uh, what do you do to assess them? Uh, Tilda, what do you do to assess them? We take a history and exam and we do some investigation. I'm straight, you do. That's one. Uh, so you, again, from that framework, uh, can you actually tell, can you tell me what your review of systems is for, for respiratory? I'm honestly not too sure. I think the way that I've been doing it is just going from like head to toe, like headaches, migraines, dizzy. But oh, okay. I suppose for rest, you'd want to do cardiovascular as well um, yeah actually that's a, if you were doing the, like say you got a really complex patient with so many different things you could do a top to tail so the systems review and that's actually a pretty decent approach in our exams and you know take it for what what it is in your exams i suspect that they'll say do a cardiovascular assessment and you'll do a cardiovascular systems review respiratory assessment respiratory systems review it, it's because it's too it's too much to give you a question for everything even though you might do something like that in real life so and just thinking off the top of your head, what kind of respiratory signs and symptoms would sh uh, could you ask about? Um, well, we could ask about infection, so yep. like fever, um, rigors. Um, we could ask about if there's pain on inspiration, Perfect. wheeze, um, like shortness of breath. Yes. Um, yeah, chest pain. Um, yep. That's actually really good. Uh, you, what you've done there, you've gone, okay, I know the stuff that can affect the chest infections. Therefore, that's, you know, fever, rigors, maybe sputum, sputum production. Like if they've got asthma, they've got wheeze. So that's the thing. If they've got some kind of obstruction to the airway, that's hoarseness of voice, stridor or infections can cause hoarseness as well. So that's literally the process they went to, you know, do the systems review. So I've got cough, shortness of breath, sputum, hemoptysis, hoarseness, stridor, wheeze, the sound stuff then fever nights to it. So that's a fever kind of cancer stuff. Um, and then all the other usual history stuff as well. So if this patient then comes in with regular sputum production and cough, they feel unwell, febrile to 38 degrees, on daily salbutamol and Symbicord and Spireva, often on prednisolone, the oral steroid tablets, uh, which are you know pretty, you're getting to some decent, decent uh, COPD if you're constantly on those two hospital admissions every year and coarse crackles and wheeze and bronchial breathing uh, on examination and no spirometry results and no regular specialist consults. I want you guys to now just using that information, take a few seconds, just say to yourselves uh, what you, how you'd present this case to me and I'll, then I'll pick on someone. Uh, maybe I'll pick on uh, Karina Chi if she's around and if not, Kieran. So just take your time, just try to synthesize the information. 
present, you know, quick summary, age, gender, what they've come in, come in with, diagnosis, severity, stability. That's all you got to say because then more detail you can support it with. So a 60-year-old male um, who presented with... Um, Let's say the re regular sputum and cough, production and cough. Regular sputum production and cough um, and a fever of 38 degrees. Um, this is on a background of a history of COPD. Um, That's, a which, That's a good summary. Keep going. Um, is being treated with salbutamol, McCord, and Spreva. Now, come here, I'm going to stop you there because you've given me a summary, but now I want you to just take a gamble on the diagnosis that's happening now, uh, but without going through the, the exact history that you've already got for me. Okay. Um, I'd say it's likely that this is like an acute exacerbation of his COPD. If you now said this is most likely an acute exacerbation of his chronic COPD, that's the diagnosis. That's perfect. Yeah, and you'll get an idea of what the language we use is. And, but that's definitely, so that's really great. You're a second year med student and you already know about that. That's, that's fantastic. Now, what's the next step after diagnosis? Stability. Yeah, severity. severity and stability. How bad do you think it is and how stable, how acute, how new is this? You can just be <laughs> sure. I know, and there's, that's absolutely appropriate that you're not sure. Uh, even I'm not that sure because I'm not a respiratory physician, but I want you to just tell me what do you reckon? Uh, and you can use words like this is likely, this is, you know, mild to moderate, moderate to severe. You can just give a gamble of this. I'm saying the point of that is to make you sound like you've done a synthesized assessment. I don't care if you're right, no one knows if you're right um, until we get some actual results with spirometry and specialists. But as a medical student, as an intern, you can still gamble on this and you'll still sound very good. Um, well, in terms of severity, I'd say this is definitely um, moderate to severe. Boom. Given that is absolutely right. That's exactly what I said. Keep going. Stability. What do you reckon? You've already almost said it because you said it's acute on chronic. What does that mean to you? Yeah. Is that so, stable? <laughs> that is um, unstable. <laughs> He's not yeah. stable. That's good. That's good. So what's going on? You give me a diagnosis, infective exacerbation of chronic COPD, acute on chronic COPD is also a term you can use. Often it's acute infective exacerbation, the severity, it's moderate, severe, exactly what you said. You know, I'm a, what is it? 14, maybe even longer person. I've, I've been doing this for 20 years and that's exactly what I said. You, and you're a second year med student. You said moderate to severe. That's fantastic. It, this is supported by hospitalizations, regular Ventolin use, prednisolone use, and the fact that they've got no specialist input to really help them. So that gives me some indication of badness. And then it's acute effective, infective pathology. Therefore, by definition, it's unstable. You will hear, when I say severity and stability, you will hear the words unstable and stable. You'll hear the words acute. You'll hear the words sudden. You'll hear the words, like say if it's rheumatoid arthritis, I've heard the words, you know, this is hot arthritis or, you know, hot joint instead of a cold joint. There's lots of, you know, other words for this. But that's important because of the way how active something is right now. Um, in terms of stability, would you just say it's either stable or unstable? Because um, yeah. I was, Go obviously on. it didn't sound very good what he's going through, but I was just thinking I would want to know what his baseline level of function is to be able to like compare to that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and that's all good. And obviously I haven't given you too much about that in this. Um, his baseline level sounds like it's pretty bad anyway. So he's probably got baseline moderate to severe. And again, just take, make a gamble on that. And he's got this exacerbation, which he's come in with because he's febrile. You know, no one's chronically febrile unless they're pretty unwell. So you're right to say, what's the baseline? And I've only given you so much information. It's completely artificial, but to express the point that you want to get to this level of communication after synthesizing your assessment. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Um, so summary, assessment is for diagnosis, supersized assessment by estimating the severity and stability. Again, you're a second year med student, just give it a go. It doesn't matter if you're wrong, but it just makes your delivery sound better. And a lot of your management will be tailored towards, if it's severe, I got to treat it straight away with the, the big guns. And if it's mild, I can, I've got time and I can start more conservative measures. There's so many things that are, you know, 
determined by severity and stability that that's why we think this is very important um and that's that's why you know this is kind of the constant conversation that us specialists will have and but it's for some reason it's not something we necessarily communicate to junior doctors or interns or medical students so that that's what was surprising to me when i became became, became a consultant so what next so now this is just a little bit, obviously we only have so much time and I want to t tell you everything in my brain. Uh, but if you really want to get your assessments to the boss level, you've got to be a bit of a detective. So just to paraphrase this with the fact that at the med student level, you probably don't have that much time to get too many things out. So I don't want to cloud, you know, the, the, the culture of medical student assessments, but this is how I think I'm a detective about these things. So as soon as I get, a pathology and I do my kind of full severity stability assessment with the tools of history examination investigation. I now use, I think about the causes and risk factors and complications framework to find out everything else that's going on if I had all the time in the world. So the physicians, they really do this because when they do their exams and when they, they do their assessments, they've got like, you know, half an hour, an hour to do this. So when you have a diagnosis, think about what caused the diagnosis and what it could cause to really understand everything about the patient's disease process. So let's look at our COPD patient. Why does he have COPD? Is it smoking history? Is it occupational? Is it some strange alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? But whatever it is, I'm gonna be looking for this because suddenly this just creates a whole bundle of things. Suddenly he'll have you know, all the smoking complications. If it's occupational, there'll be all these things about his work environment and, you know, what else is going on? Is it asbestosis as well? Is mesothelioma is a risk? And if it's alpha-1 antitrypsin, is this going to affect, you know, his lungs and I think other, other organs as well, like um, I think it's pancreas as well. So suddenly I can get a whole bunch of other histories just thinking about what caused this. Again, if you have COPD, smoking and repeat infections and treatments for these, what can this cause? And suddenly I've got a whole, I've opened a whole other can of worms about this because now I've got, I've, you know, I've done my severity stability of COPD, but suddenly I'm going, is this, you know, bad pneumonia? Is it bronchiectasis? Is it lung cancer? Does this patient have hemoptysis and other signs? If they're on constant prednisolone, that's just a whole new ball game. Does this patient have osteoporosis needing vitamin D and calcium supplements and weight bearing exercise? Do they have cataracts because of the steroids? Do you have diabetes because of steroids, gastric ulcers, Cushing syndrome? You can see how each one of these diseases that you find or diagnose has a cause and complications. And this just colors your history and the patient's presentation much more. Again, at medical student level, if you're doing an assessment, um, you, know, you know, if you're being assessed formally, they, you may not have time to get into this. So I don't want to make this, I, I don't want to give you too much information so your assessments will suffer. Um, but if you're in the real world, this is how we do it. Cool. So summary, assess with history, examination, investigations to find a diagnosis. You need to ascertain severity and stability of the disease and uncover other pathologies by looking for the cause and complications. Present this in a clinically relevant way to show that you understand the issues. Hey, I, you know, I'd really love it. You all have my email. If you're on the wards and you're asked to do an assessment and present it, and if you do end up presenting in this way and you get really good feedback, I'd, I'd love to hear from it. Like if, um, you know, if I'm, if what I'm teaching you is completely stupid, I really want to know. Uh, but I think that if I knew, if I knew this as a med student, I think it would really help me. Okay. Now we're just going to take it to the next level now. So the critical issue in presenting a case, this is going to, this, this is a lot of what I, I teach a whole eight hours for my part two um, exam candidates. So, you know, we'll have maybe a hundred people around Australia that I'm teaching this one thing to, which is the critical issue. And again, it's something that's not taught in a formal way, but the uh, whole exam and a lot of what I do as, a, as, a, as an anesthetist is find this issue and put all of my effort into sorting that one issue. Now I'll tell you what I mean by this. So the road to competency and consultancy is, is, a, is a long one. This is the first journey that you've probably done, unless you're an elite sportsman, that you'll, you know, you'll not get to competency un until you've done thousands or tens of thousands of something, you know, of seeing patients, of doing histories, of doing IV cannulas or whatever it is. So once you've done the regular history exam and investigation management of, you know, hundreds and thousands of patients, you'll notice these patterns. And then you'll notice that things fall into the normal pattern that are, you know, relatively easy to manage or just normal to manage. Like you're just so used to managing an elderly Maltese man with chest pain who has, uh, you know, is having a acute coronary syndrome. 
and you'll be, you know, managing a 60 year old smoker with some COPD, you know, these are familiar patterns, or maybe you'll be managing a young anxious person with a tachycardia and, and that's an SVT or something like that. So these things fall into very similar patterns. When you find something distinct about a scenario, pay attention. And that's what this whole section is about. And when you communicate that you sound sharp. And also when you prioritize that particular difference or point of difference or critical issue, suddenly, um, you know, you, you'll be able to put all of your energy into that to sorting this extra problem out. So the critical issue could be anything. It could be the patient. Maybe the patient is a normal patient, you know, 24 year old, but suddenly has a big thyroid. So, suddenly that's the critical issue. Um, the pathology might be very specific to, uh, you know, a, a certain environment um, and extra to what the surgical operation could be. Um, maybe your staff are really junior. Maybe you have limited staff because you're in some, you know, say an elsewhere's hospital or doing, going rural. Suddenly that will be a real problem. Uh, maybe the surgeon, the anesthetist, the physician are particularly, you know, peculiar to want of a better word. And that might be the difference in how you treat a patient. Uh, the hospital facility, again, might be very small with that ICU backup. So these are all the different ways you could have a point of difference or a critical issue. So this first case, a 24-year-old with right iliac fossa pain, it started centrally. Now it's focused at the right iliac fossa. They've got a bit of nausea, anorexia as well, and a raised CRP and white cell count. Now, uh, how do you present this case? Um, I would say um, 24 year old male presented to the ED with classic symptoms of appendicitis. He has um, currently experiencing right iliac fossa pain, which started essentially um, now localized in the right iliac fossa mm -hmm. associated with nausea and anorexia and investigation showed raised um, CRP and white cell count. Beautiful. That's great. So what I like that you did again, you said, you know, 24 year old male, so age, gender, you gave me a diagnosis. Um, and then you gave me the detail. So if I'm a consultant and I've heard what your diagnosis is, if I, if I, you know, if I know that you know your stuff, I'll go, yep, that's great. Let's go on with it. If I don't know you, if I need more information, which is often the case when you're junior, I'll say, yep, let me know why you think that. And then I'll be able to pick that apart. So the framework therefore you had was age, gender, because these are very typical, you know, risk stratification and demographic things that really help anyone in determining what, you know, where this is going to head. I give a likely diagnosis, exactly what you did there. And then I just say the urgency or stability, uh, and then the treatment that I'll be doing. So, you know, this is for an urgent appendicectomy, or most likely we'll need to go to theater. If you're not sure, most likely you need to go to theater urgently because it's appendicitis. And then I would identify the critical issue. Now in this one, this was a very standard appendix, right? Young person, classical symptoms. I like that you said that classical symptoms of appendicitis, but there's nothing really critical about this. this. This is the norm. But what I'm going to focus on is habit if it's not normal and how do you present that? So let's say, how about if the patient was 84 years old? Amy, what do you, what do you reckon? How would this change your presentation if the patient was 84 years old? Um, I would I would have had to gather more information because if we're suspecting he's urgent for surgery, we have a lot of risk factors in the elderly population that we need to account for, yes. um, such as diabetes status and how controlled the diabetes is and how stable it is, mm -hmm. last insulin taken, meds that they're on. Um, you know, do they have COPD or respiratory issues? Um, you the, know, is there going to be a problem uh -huh. with intubation? You've done a good, you've done a, done a good assessment, and they've got actually no other issues, um, except the fact that they're now an 84-year-old with appendicitis, because that's not your normal. You said there's this is classical symptoms of appendicitis. What would you say for this one? If it's, this is not classical, right? It's not, it's not a 24-year-old or a young person. Um, I would say that um, I'm querying appendicitis. Perfect. That's exactly it. <laughs> So this is not normal. Appendicitis often isn't an 84 year old. So I would argue that this deviation from normal is the critical issue. So this is what you have to emphasize every day of the week. Uh, what, what could it be? What, what would you worry about an 84 year old with, you know, appendicitis or symptoms like appendicitis? This, I might this... worry about like ischemia. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't Maybe there? ischemic bowel because suddenly 84 year olds have a lot of other pathologies that could cause you know, clots to form there or, you know, whatever it is. 
Um, and, and it can be you know, malignancy as well. Malignancy in elderly people is far more common than young people. And that could be what's causing this uh, inflammation or this point of um, inflammation in the bowel. So for example, I would then present this exactly how you said, Amy, but 84 year old with right iodic phosphine for urgent surgery, the age is not typical for appendicitis and it increased my suspicion, suspicion for more sinister pathology. So I would query the diagnosis of appendicitis, though it seems like it, it, it is. This is what I'd emphasize. So the point of this, just to get back to the framework, this framework provides a snapshot, age, gender, likely diagnosis, urgency, stability, and treatment. Um, and the critical issues gives you the specific things that you need to do. And then in more detail, just allows you to give more detail to your, to your supervisor or consultant. So just to give, kind of extend that now, 60-year-old male presents with tight central chest pain, past history of hypertension, cholesterol, smoker, diabetes. Um, just to put you on the spot, Cindy, how do you present this? Um, a 60-year-old male presenting, okay, so I have a 60-year-old male, he presents to somewhere with tight central chest pain mm -hmm. on a background of a lot of coronary risk factors, I would say, so hypertension, cholesterol, smoking, diabetes. Um, I would classify this as likely to be a myocardial infarction would be the thing that I would want to rule out. Mm -hmm. um, possibly dissection as well. Uh, and that would be supported by the risk factors as well as, Absolutely. I guess, this presentation. You've given me the framework, which is age, gender, and you've said likely myocardial infarction. I, I, I'll often use this term likely, it just sounds like, you know, if I don't have all the information, I'm, it gives me, gives me the leeway. So it presents with likely acute stomach coronary syndrome, and I haven't given you much other information, sorry, uh, with multiple cardiac risk factors, which you mentioned. Um, needing urgent treatment. So there's obviously bad, it needs urgent treatment. And in more detail, you can go through all your history, examination and investigations. Now let's just throw a spanner in the work. So how does this change now if you're a GP or in a small peripheral hospital, like say Williamstown Hospital, you know, a couple of theaters, no ICU, a couple of wards. Um, other Cindy, what, what do you reckon? How does this change your presentation oh, as you're presenting the case? severity would be higher because you don't have the support like in a bigger hospital exactly so it would be more urgent for him to be transferred to the hospital with the um, appropriate support that's good now if you were to present the whole case i completely agree with you you gave me the keywords which is you know transfer it will be more severe or more risky you might say because i'm in a, in a place where i don't have all the supports how would you present this case to me? Uh, so you've seen this patient, tight central chest pain, looks pretty bad, the ECG isn't good, uh, and you're in a peripheral hospital. I want you to present this case to me. Uh, the 60-year-old male presents with likely acute coronary syndrome, mm -hmm. um, needing urgent treatment. I would suggest um, we, we call it ambulance immediately. Yeah, that's right. Adult retrieval yeah. services, ambulance, you get some, a whole other person or team to organize that um, because that's, that's what you'll need. That might be yourself as well. So now the critical issue might be the lack of interventional cardiology service and specialty services and the need for urgent transfer. So, you know, or you can do everything you need to stabilize this patient right now. But the point of this case, the thing that gets you the win, the thing that saves this patient's life is your ability to understand the need for urgent transfer. So a six-year-old male, presented with likely acute coronary syndrome, exactly what you said, with multiple cardiac risk factors and needs urgent transfer for treatment. Now, suddenly that is a big deal. Uh, someone else, anyone else? Um, how does it change if the patient had recent cardiac stents? This is a re-MI, potentially. So I think it's like some ridiculous statistic, like almost up to 50% of patients who have an MI will have a recurrent MI um, within X amount of time. Yeah, especially if they're not on the right anticoagulants or they're a poor metabolite mm -hmm. of the clopidogrel. So yeah, exactly. Now it's super, super high risk. It's instant thrombosis. You've put some metal in there. It's opened up the artery and now that's closed off. That is, that's terrible. So now this normal presentation, which is already bad, has now changed. And now the most critical issue that needs to be managed immediately is the fact that it's not just a transfer thing or it's not just a myocardial infarction thing. It's the instant thrombosis. You'll, you'll, again, I'm, I'm just throwing these situations at you, but uh, what you'll notice now is that you'll get lots and lots of normal 
And every time, and you'll realize over time, over the next few years of seeing patterns, what normal is. And then once, once in a while you'll get abnormal and that will be the whole point of what you need to do because the normal stuff gets handled very easily because you're, if you're, if you're familiar with a patient environment, environment and specialty, you'll know that the systems are in place to manage those things very efficiently. But as soon as there's a critical issue or a difference to the normal, that will be difficult to manage. And that's where you often need to put a lot of your attention to. And in this case, interventional cardiology, transfer, heparin infusion, antiplatelets, and you know, just the, the whole kidney caboodle. Final case, guys. So 50-year-old female for total thyroidectomy for a large goiter. What do you know, want to know on assessment impact? This is a pretty advanced case. Um, I wouldn't have known this at all as a med student. But in addition to my usual pre-op surgical assessment, which probably is the, just a the normal history, including what surgeries they've had in the past and all that stuff. After all of that history examining investigations, I really care about just three things. Does anyone want to have a go at the things that were specifically important to this, aside from all the usual surgical stuff? I'm going to, I'm going to work you guys through it. If your thyroid is being a bit too, you know, active, what's it going to cause? Hyperthyroidism. Yeah, exactly. So your normal history is normal and Captain Obvious of statements, but it's really important. You've got to make sure that this patient's thyroid is euthyroid and it's not hyperthyroid because if the patient gets a, what they call a thyroid storm or sudden hyperthyroidism or is thyroid toxic intraoperatively, that is a really big deal. That's, that's a high mortality or morbidity event. So euthyroid. The next thing is if this, if this thyroid gets really big, what things it, could it compress? Airway. Exactly. What else could it compress? Airway and something else that's really important. The stuff that gives you life. Airway gives you life. Is it the carotids? You're close. It's vascular structures. If this, if this thyroid gets down into your chest, it will c cause pressure on all the uh, respiratory stuff. So trachea, bronch bronchus, and that could be really bad. So the worst I've seen is a narrowing of your trachea. Usually your trachea is about, say, you know, a centimeter or so, 10 millimeters, 15 millimeters even. It can go down to five millimeters or less, and that is just horrendously difficult to manage. And I want to know that straight away. And as a, you know, any cis or surgeon, you want to know that straight away. Uh, you also want to know if this um, compresses other low pressure structures. So not necessarily the high pressure structures like carotids, but your pulmonary vessels are low pressure. Your um, right heart is low pressure. Your superior vena cava is low pressure. This could obstruct that. Um, the final thing is, so these are kind of just really obvious things that you could think about and you can rule out with a good history examination and a good CT or MRI of that region. And the final thing is, is it malignancy? And that's a more specialist thing. It whole, changes a lot of the management you might do for this as well. But that's, that's my whole pre-op surgical assessment. But I really focus on those extra points because that makes all the difference. That will be the highest mortality event or morbidity events are from that. So that's just a bit of a taster of the way I approach all my situations and how you can sound better to, you know, when you're, when you're presenting your cases and doing your assessments. Any questions about that before we wrap that up? So summary, age, gender, likely diagnosis, urgency or stability and treatment communicates a snapshot of the whole situation. The critical issues communicates the crucial details that may need more attention. So really useful to present that. Um, and then, you know, you can always give in more detail if you want to, if you, you know, if your consultant wants more, more information. Okay. So this is the cardiac patient for non-cardiac surgery. Um, when you're doing your surgical rotations, the most common question you'll have is whether I postpone or proceed. And it's actually be quite a difficult question, except for the fact that we've actually got really good guidelines on it. And again, I only learned this as maybe a late basic trainee or advanced trainee. So that's like a sixth, seventh year doctor, but it's stuff that you will, you could easily understand now and know where to go to the, you know, I can give you the resources of where to read and go into the guidelines. So you'll have as much knowledge as anyone, any expert in this field, if you know these guidelines. So this is the guideline 2014 ACC AHA guideline on perioperative cardiovascular evaluation. And that's the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. This, this is like the, you know, these are the, the godfathers of everything to do cardiovascularly. Now, this is the complex kind of guideline, which we're going to go through, but it's actually really easy. If you guys remember, every anesthetist really loves morning coffee. It's just a true fact. You'll, you'll do every other rotation and on the anesthetic rotation, every single time you will get offered a coffee and you'll be like, why am I still taking a break? I, I don't understand. I've got, I haven't, I haven't done any work yet. Uh, so th this is, and this is what it stands for. So 
E, every, is for emergency. A, anesthesis, is for active cardiac condition. R, risk, is for, you know, is it low risk? And M is for METs. And then C is for, will testing change management? Okay, so I'll go into that in a bit more detail. So imagine the situation. You now have patients who come in to see you. If you follow this algorithm, you will know exactly what to do, whether you need to refer and postpone the surgery or whether you're safe to proceed. And this will be so relevant, relevant to you time and time again in the pre-admission clinic, or if you've got a patient who's about to go for surgery and you, you know, you're know, you trying to decide whether to refer to these nieces or not, you'll, you'll still be able to refer to them, but you'll be able to you know, have a framework for why they make the decisions, which they may not express to you. And it's really good that you understand this stuff. So I'm just going to go through some of the detail, but then we'll go through scenarios. So actually just take a screenshot of this or take a photo of this because I'll keep referring it. So emergency surgery, this is essentially, there's no time for thorough evaluation. The patient's bleeding out and you just have to crack on. Like, you know, it doesn't matter if they're having a heart attack. If they don't have the surgery, they bleed out and they die. You have to crack on. Uh, so that's, that's, that's pretty easy. That's kind of the easiest situation, terrible for the patient, but easiest decision I've ever had to make is crack on with a patient when they're having, when they're needing emergency surgery. Active cardiac conditions. This is again, high level stuff, but it's just anything that's very serious. So recent MI or current MI unstable or severe angina decompensated heart failure, you know, really, really bad, you know, shortness of breath, just resting severe valves. So severe aortic stenosis, uh, symptomatic mitral stenosis, and then any significant arrhythmias. So, you know, the high grade, slow stuff, third degree block, Mobitz type two, you'll learn all these in good time and fast stuff, you know, near recognized VT or SVTs, like atrial fibrillation, rapid atrial flutter. Now, low risk surgery. That's the next question you'll ask. This is, it's pretty easy. It's just anything that doesn't take much from the body. Cataracts, small incision, superficial lumps and bumps, small incision scopes, just a scope in whichever region of the body doesn't really leave too much left for the body to heal. So anything that's that is low risk surgery. And if it is low risk, as long as they don't have an active cardiac condition, they can proceed. Uh, I want you to just take a photo of this riskcalculator.facs.org. Have a play around with that website. It's an amazing resource to find the uh, estimate the risk for your patients. Um, and I really recommend you just the you know, next surgical patient you have on the ward, just plugging the values in and you'll find out a whole bunch of details about what the risk level is. Everything from you know likelihood of death to severe complications, to cardiac complications, to discharge, to rehab, a whole bunch of stuff. So www.riskcalculator.facs.org. That's just an extra resource, but we'll we'll stick with the low risk surgeries for this exercise. Uh, a met a met is the ratio of metabolic rate to resting metabolic rate. So it's just how much can my body mobilize oxygen? Uh, can, how how well can my heart and lungs work to mobilize oxygen nutrients to the organs that need it? And so four mets which is defined as stair, being able to do stair climbing at a slow pace or walking at a very specific 5.6 kilometers per hour. Uh, this is defined as having four mets, okay? And then finally, will testing change management? These days, this is often not too much of a question because testing will often change management. Now, I'm gonna go into the exercise just because it'll make more sense to you now uh, once we go through it. So let's say you get a, patient 68 year old with a non STEMI two weeks prior and ongoing unstable angina has a car accident and there's free fluid in the abdomen. The surgeon you know, needs to take this patient to theater urgently. Now they're having a heart attack, right? But they've got this other problem that they probably have ruptured something in the bowel. Do you postpone for cardiology review or do you go straight to surgery? I think it's, I mean, you would want to do surgery on him because he could be bleeding out and hemodynamically like unstable. Yes. So that's like your top priority right now, but I would definitely refer him to like an anesthetist or something. Exactly. Again, you, all of this is really high level stuff. So you would call the anesthetist, you'd call the surgeon, you'd call the cardiologist as well, but you're right. Your gut feeling is right that at the end of the day, if the patient bleeds out, the heart attack isn't going to get any better. There's nothing a cardiologist can do interventionally it's not like they can go for 
you know, open bypass surgery or put a stent in place. They, they just can't do any of that whilst a patient is bleeding out. And so the urgency always trumps the cardiovascular stuff. And if you look at that flow chart, every anesthetist loves morning coffee. Uh, every is emergency. Emergency equals proceed. So that's really good. The next level is the fractured and off. So this is, this is kind of urgent. Like this has to be done relatively urgently, like within 24 to 48 hours. Because if a fractured and off patient, even though it doesn't seem like it's an emergency, a fractured and off is often an older patient, older patient that if they can't mobilize due to pain, will get pressure sores, pulmonary embolism, uh, DVTs causing pulmonary embolisms, pneumonias because they're just lying in bed in pain. And they will have a high mortality without this operation. So it's still urgent. And so what do you do? This patient has now fluid overload, um, AF, ischemic heart disease. Do you want to investigate or do you want to proceed? I think proceed. Yeah, that's sure. right. No, that's right. Again, high level stuff. But the framework is you would treat anything you can in a short time frame. So you could treat rapid atrial fibrillation. You could give some frusamide for CCF. Again, stuff that you could get your you know, cardiology friend or your gen med registrar to help you with. You could treat and treat severe sepsis with antibiotics. And if they've lost a bit of blood, you can give a bit of blood. So you can treat stuff in a short time frame, but just to get the point across that this is semi-urgent, uh, you know, it has to be done within 24 to 48 hours. And you can't, don't, again, don't have time for cardiovascular investigations. The first one was super urgent, patients bleeding out right away. This one's semi-urgent or just urgent, and you'd still have to crack on. Is this what we call optimization, like optimizing the patient? Yeah, that is part of, this is one way you can optimize the patient and it's a very rapid way of optimizing the patient. So that's absolutely right. There's various levels of optimizing. Um, for example, if someone comes in with a bit of a wheeze while they're about to have a lap collie or some other procedure, you could optimize them by giving what? Subutamol. Exactly. That's, that's also optimizing anything to make the patient better from what better than what they are. Now there's a final level of kind of emergency, and this is called a time sensitive operation. Often cancers, you don't want to wait, right? So 70 year old male PR bleeding, secondary colon carcinoma, they're a diabetic cholesterol hypertension. So, you know, and they've got unknown exercise tolerance. So they're not really doing much. So you're worried that their heart might be a little bit, you know, not great. They might have something, but they've got a colon cancer. So, do you have time to do intervention or CAGs in this? What do you reckon? Do you want to proceed with this case and go straight to theater when you're, when you're a bit unsure about the patient's heart or do you want to postpone for weeks and weeks? Um, probably not postpone for weeks and weeks, but at least until you know what's going on with the heart because yeah, good. he's got, he's had a colon carcinoma and likely has existed for a little while previously. So it's not an, an urgent emergency. Yeah, good. So this is what we call a time sensitive procedure. And again, according to those guidelines, anything that's in that emergency category, which this is, you don't, you generally don't need to, you'd still call cardiology, get their advice, but there's very little that they could do in a two week, say time frame to fix any cardiac disease. Plus this patient's having a colon cancer. This is a bit of a higher level discussion, but just to, this is just to complete the picture that emergency surgeries generally need to go ahead and don't have time for referral and postman. You optimize what you can, but generally speaking, you'd have, probably have to crack on with this case. Again, none of these uh, decisions that you guys will be ma making on your own until you're you know, senior registrars or consultants, but I really just want you to give you an idea of that, that there are these guidelines out there. And this is a very common guideline that as a surgical registrar, definitely as an anesthetic, sorry, as a surgical doctor or anesthetic doctor, you'll be thinking about time and time again, once you know this. So the, you know, the MVA ruptured something in the, in the bowel, the NOF and cancer operations, especially the malignant cancer operations, they're all emergency, urgent, or time sensitive, and they generally proceed, but may need a nuanced discussion. So let's go through this one. So what's, what's the um, next category after emergency in that flow chart? Oh yeah, active cardiac condition is great. So now, and anything active is something that's not particularly stable. So Ricky, what do you reckon of this 60 year old lady for lap collie, chronic AF, but now the chronic AF has turned really fast. 
the rate's now 140, which is obviously not normal. Um, what do you reckon? Do you postpone or do you proceed to having an elective operation, not an emergency? Yeah, so if we're following the flow chart, I guess we'll have to refer to a, a cardiologist. Brilliant. And see how easy that is? You just go, is this emergency? No, it's a lap collie, most often elective. Is it active? Yeah, it's, it's too fast. This rate is too fast. Therefore, we have to refer to cardiology because this is an active cardiac condition. How about this one here? 50-year-old male for inguinal hernia repair with trifascicular block with multiple fainting episodes. Um, I don't believe that it is um, emergent nor urgent or time sensitive yep. for an inguinal hernia repair. So therefore refer to cardiology um, and proceed after the patient, the cardiologist gives the go ahead. Exactly. This is, an active, this is potentially an active cardiac condition. Trifascicular block with multiple fainting episodes sounds like they're having intermittent third degree heart block or something bad's going on. Um, and even if it was trifascicular block, as a junior, you'd still refer. They're generally stable lesions, but you know, you'd still have to refer for that. So that's great. Again, the utility of this flow chart is amazing in my practice. So again, that's exactly what I need you to do. So these are all active cardiac conditions. They have high mortality, postpone and refer. Okay, so the next category, what's the next category uh, we're talking about? So after every anesthetist really loves, what are, what's R and L? Risk. And then the L is if risk is zero to one risk factors, proceed. Yeah, good. So exactly. So let's just keep it simple with if the surgery is super low risk for getting the patient, if the surgery is low risk, you can generally proceed. Um, so uh, Cindy, what do you reckon? Cindy, 78 year old female, recent echo showing moderate aortic stenosis. So this, this is moderate aortic stenosis isn't severe, isn't, isn't an active cardiac condition. It's moderate. They're having cataract surgery. They've got no other symptoms to say it's severe. But they can't walk up a flight of stairs. So, they, you know, they're pretty unfit. You don't know what else is going on. Do you proceed or do you postpone? I feel like because it is a low risk surgery, I would probably proceed. But okay. I'm. That is correct. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm asking you questions that I ask my advanced trainees in anesthesia. And I, so you'll feel weird saying these answers because you'll never be making these decisions for the next few years. But because, again, you're at the point of asking these questions. If you know this guideline, this will, this will be useful. So you're exactly right. It's an elective operation. It's not an active cardiac condition. It's low risk. It's a cataract. Therefore I can proceed. Let's get this patient, 60 year old male for a lap collie, unknown exercise tolerance due to back pain. Actually, we'll skip this one. But again, elective surgery, no active conditions, low risk and proceed. Now this one is a bit interesting. 60 year old male, total hip replacement. AF is controlled at 70 cholesterol, hypertension, obese, stays in bed most days, doesn't walk much. Um, can you, someone step me through this, uh, you know, what, what, what do they think about for this patient? Yeah, cool. elective operation, um, active cardiac condition. Mm -hmm. Is there um, anything in that history? Yeah, so he's got atrial fibrillation. And, um, and, and that's a good question. So if it's, just to let you know, if it's, controlled they're on medications the heart rate is less than 100 that's thought to be okay. controlled f so it's not an active condition if it was like 140 150 above 100 yeah. then we're worried it's active so there's okay. no active cardiac conditions so what's the next level uh, we'd use our risk calculator beautiful and if we just say is this surgery low risk surgery would you say it's low risk or above low risk or i would not? say it's above be above low risk so exactly. not low risk Exactly. So the next thing you want to know is the METs. Can this patient achieve four METs? Um, okay. what, 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 what could you ask this patient? Um, this is a tricky question. I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but I would, my guess would be not. Yeah. So you could ask, or you could take them for a walk up a couple of flights of stairs. You can ask them, you know, do you walk upstairs? You could ask them activities they're living. And then once you get used to this, once you know what the definition of METs are, if they have enough METs, then you'd be pretty safe to say, oh, well, this is going to be a well-tolerated operation because the patient has enough METs. But we don't know that. So we have to be very um, cautious. So it's not emergency surgery. You're correct. There's no active cardiac conditions. You're correct. It's not low risk surgery. You're correct. And if the METs are good, I feel like proceeding is reasonable. But if the METs are poor or unknown, then you might want to investigate. So that's how, that's how the decision tree works for this. 
And same with this one. I'd ask them, can you walk up two flights of stairs? If they can do formats, then I can proceed. Now, at the very bottom end of stuff, you might have a patient with all of the problems. It's an elective operation. There's no active process, like ischemic heart disease, diabetic, stable heart failure, stroke, you know, TIA in the past, hypertension, cholesterol, asthma, poor exercise tolerance, like everything bad. And how do you know what to do? This is where you definitely have to, you know, even as a anesthetic registrar, they would often refer to me to help make that decision because it just requires a, um, a high level conversation about what, the, what we need to do. Um, but elective surgery, no active conditions, not low risk, less than four mets because they just, they just can't mobilize, you know, their heart, lungs or their, you know, exercise tons can't be mobilized and has multiple cardiac risk factors. This patient is at high risk and probably will need referral for cardiac testing before they go for an operation. So again, what I wanted to get out of this talk is just to very briefly give you the framework that every anesthetist and in, you know, with relevance to surgery uses day in, day out to decide whether we can proceed or postpone. And the beauty about this guideline is if you have any problem, whether it's respiratory, renal, liver, or cardiac, you can use this same format. So for example, if someone has active wheezing, you treat that, you postpone, and then once they're settled, you can go ahead. And that might be treating it just before surgery, or it might mean a whole progressive treatment with you know, a, you know, weeks of preventers, serotide, Symbicor, whatever it is. But if they have well-controlled asthma, that's, you know, it's optimized. It's not an active state and they're just going for a lipoma excision, which is low risk, then you can proceed. So I use the exact same format, whether it's cardiac or not. So again, 30 year old open lap collie, known COPD, multiple exacerbations recently. What do you do? It's active cardiac condition, or it's an active condition, sorry. So you postpone and treat, but if it's now well controlled after you've done that, then, and they've got a good exercise tolerance, it's elective surgery, no active conditions, not low risk, and it's greater than the format, so proceed. So again, this is way beyond what you guys will need to know as medical students, um, but I don't apologize for that because if you know this, it will make it will make the whole perioperative process sound much more understandable to you, especially when you're on your anesthetic rotations doing pre-admission clinic or on your surgical rotations referring to anesthetics and trying to decide who to continue with. <laughs> is what I usually say to um, my, my students, if you're mind blown, because they've never seen this, uh, this used in, uh, in, such a, in such a different way. So that's the summary, emergency, proceed, active disease, refer, is it low risk, then proceed, do they have greater than four METs, then proceed, and will testing change management, that's the stuff you'll generally have to have a consultant conversation with. Good, so that's my summary for that. Um, any questions, that's pretty much what I wanted to get, the three things that every consultant knows, but never tells you until now. That was really, really helpful, I think. See you guys later. Thank you, Thank you for showing this. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Cindy. You. Thanks, guys.